All right, hello everyone. I'm Lana. I work at West Orange Public Library. I'm doing collection development and occasional book discussions. First of all, I wanted to thank uh, everyone who's joining us tonight. And uh, we already have done six virtual author visits. And sadly, today is the last one that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be recording this presentation and it will be available on YouTube channel and our Facebook. And uh, now it's my sincere pleasure to introduce Lucy Tan, who is the author of the book, What We Were Promised. Uh, the book was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and named a best book of 2018 by the Washington Post, Refinery29, and Amazon. Her short fiction has been published in journals such as Plowshares, Asia Literary Review, and Maxwini. A recipient of fellowship from Kundiman and the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing, Lucy is originally from New Jersey and currently lives in Seattle. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you so much, Lana. Can everyone see me? Yes. Um, great. Um, I'm so happy to be here tonight. I love actually doing events with libraries um, because my mom was a librarian and I grew up actually going to the Livingston Library every day after school. Um, and it had a lot of impact on, you know, my growth as a human and as a writer. And so, um, yeah, thank you for being here. I love connecting with library communities. Um, so I am the author of the novel, What We Were Promised. It is my first novel. It's currently out in paperback. Um, and um, I think I'm just gonna start by reading to you a little bit from it so that you can get a sense of the writing. Um, and so I'm gonna read from the preface. This is, set in Shanghai in 1988. It wasn't the, lane, the plain Lena feared, but the sky above the airfield. Acres of space unbroken by trees or buildings made Lena nervous. They made her feel as though she would float away. From where they stood in the Shanghai Hongqiao Airport Terminal, Lena and Wei watched the planes move around the tarmac. Men in reflective jumpsuits directed traffic with semaphores, but it seemed a, a, mir a miracle the huge machines weren't crashing into each other without physical barriers to stop them. What do you think? Wei asked, pressing his fingers against the glass. It reminds me of a funeral, Lena said. Like in American films, those big shiny cars, what do you call them? It was an odd word. She had just learned it. Purses. The planes look like a fleet of hearses. Lena hadn't meant to be gloomy, only meant to say that she was impressed by the carrier's power, their solemn elegance. They looked like the kind of vehicles that would take you someplace you would never come back from. When they finally boarded the plane an hour later, the first thing Lena noticed was the smell of foreign cigarettes, a lighter, sweeter scent than Chinese tobacco. She didn't know for sure what American cigarettes smelled like, but the scent matched her idea of America, the way long legs matched blonde hair. She gripped her husband's hand as he led the way down the aisle. Let's just enjoy ourselves, he said. Here, give me your bag. They had lucked into a row of three empty seats. Wei helped Lena buckle into the middle one, but before he could return to his own by the window, she stopped him. Wait, switch with me? If she was going to leave, she would say a proper goodbye to her home country. It felt wrong that her final glimpse of China would be of Shanghai, a city to which she was a stranger, and not her little house in the suburbs of Suzhou or the warm tree-lined campuses of Wuhan. Not looking down at the one person whom she had not truly been ready to leave. Lena felt calmer now that the evening was growing dark, the wash of blue like a safety net thrown across the sky. Soon the pilot's voice came over the PA system and then the plane started to move. Wei took her hand. He wanted this to be an experience they shared together, but she could not share it with him, yeah. would not. These last moments she'd say for herself to grieve the passing of the future that would never play out. She couldn't help it. Chang's face flashed across her mind and instead of fighting it, 
as she had been for the past few days. She let herself hold on to it, even closed her eyes to help herself remember. A dusty room filled with sunshine, her breathing heavy from climbing the stairs, and all around her the sound of mulberry leaves being torn apart by tiny mouths. Chang leaning in close, his hair in his eyes, lifting a silkworm to Lena's face. It's perfectly safe, Wei said. I promise. His voice sounded as though it came from hundreds of meters away. She focused on thoughts of the lake, the breeze coming in both cold and hot at the same time, the shadow of a boy leaping from the water's edge, his, black, his back shiny and curved like a blade. The plane began to lift. As Lena's center of gravity changed, she was pressed flat against her chair. Outside, the ground slipped from view. They were gaining speed and soon they would be far away. Far enough to cross time zones, the concept of which still made Lena's head spin. In China, a person's day might start with the sun a little higher or a little lower than that of his countrymen, but their lives were all marked by the same clock, no matter how far apart they lived. America had six time zones. Lena's father had called it the land of dreams, and so it seemed. For what other country would aspire to occupy the past, present, and future all at the same time? So there's the preface to what we were promised. Um, this is a book that is set completely in China. Its main characters are Chinese American. So uh, the couple at the center of the story, the Zhens, they were born in China, but then they moved to America and spent their entire careers there um, and had a child and raised her in the States. But when the story begins, they have since moved back to China as expats. And this is 2010. And they have sort of come to find that the country has been, it has, has changed a lot in the time they've been away. And they feel as though they're, they're strangers in their homeland. So the part that I read to you was set in 1998. That's when they're leaving. Um, but then the next chapter is when they're back in Shanghai again, and it's 2010. And they have sort of risen from, um, you know, just your typical Chinese person to, to people who have gone to graduate school in America and have gotten this degree and have, you know, made a good amount of money. And now they're back in Shanghai and they're living in this um, luxury hotel as expats. So during the time when this book takes place in 2010, there were, this was happening a lot to a lot of families who are, you know, eth eth ethically Chinese, ethnically Chinese, but had spent a lot of time in the States, maybe had jobs there, and they've now been sent back by these foreign companies to work in Shanghai. Um, so uh, this is one of those families. And so they're living in this place that is so different from from the lifestyle they had known when they were living in China as children. So the book is, is about that shift. It's about um, coming back to your homeland and finding it has totally changed. Um, I call it a reverse immigration story because it's about immigrants who have moved back. And, um, and it's really a story about identity. It's about you know reconciling your past and who you once were to who you are now and aligning your value systems in a place that is really quickly changing quickly in terms of class structure, in terms of economic power. Um, so Shanghai is fascinating to me and, and China is fascinating to me for that reason. And so I really wanted to write a book about it. And, um, this book is very much inspired by the two years that I spent in Shanghai after I graduated from college. Um, my parents are Chinese. This story closely follows their movements in their lives because they were born in China, they moved to America and moved back to China to work again. Um, it's not based on them, but I did use their lives as inspiration. So the book is told from the points of view of Lina Zhen and Wei Zhen. And Wei is this kind of corporate guy. He's head of strategy at this media conglomerate. Um, and he has, his company has moved him to, to Shanghai to head up 
a center there. And Lena, his wife, um, has come with him, but she has found that once she enters this sort of community in Shanghai of what we call Tai Tai, which are housewives who don't really do any housework, they're sort of like ladies in the lap, in the lap of luxury, um, she loses a little bit of her identity um, because I think she really derives a lot of her self-worth from you know, the struggle of acclimating in America and of, of sort of staking out new territory and helping Wei build a life together. And so when they go back to Shanghai, she's a little bit adrift. So um, those are two of the main characters. It's told in alternating perspectives, Wei and Lena. And then there's a third character and her name is Sunny. So Sunny um, starts out as a housekeeper. She's employed by the hotel that um, the hotel and service departments that Lena and, and Wei live in. So every morning, she and her partner go in and they kind of clean the rooms. They put the, they wash the dishes, you know, they put them away, they water the plants, they make the beds, they take out the trash, all of that. And she does that daily. So she kind of has a very intimate understanding of, the, of many of the residents' lives, but they barely interact. Um, her one point of interaction is with um, Lena and Wei's daughter, who is named Karen, and she is usually at boarding school in the States, but she comes home during summers. And so this summer in 2010, um, Karen has come home and Sunny is sort of, you know, um, cleaning the rooms and sort of on the periphery of the Zhen's lives when Wei Zhen receives a phone call from his brother. And this is a big deal because his brother Chang has been missing for many years. Um, he was sort of always a kind of fly by night character and, and nobody, he was always getting in trouble with the law and nobody really knew he was involved in gangs. And so for him to call and reach out is a big deal for all of them because they're hearing for, from him for the first time in many, many years. Um, and he says he wants to come to Shanghai. And he wants to come for the World Expo, for the, for the Shanghai Expo, which was happening in, in real life in 2010. Um, so this kind of kicks off um, a series of events that unravel some secrets and some, I think, long held grievances within the Zhen family. Um, the, the book is, I, I've described it before as a little bit of a love triangle, but I, I think it, it it's not quite that either. It's a story of uh, missed chances, certainly. It's a story of um, finding yourself again in a different country, in a different phase of life. So um, what happens then is a second thing kicks off the novel as well, which is that uh, there is a bracelet that goes missing from Lina Zhen's bedroom. And uh, the maids are accused, one of the maids is accused of, of stealing it. And because Karen kind of has an affiliation with Sunny and, and they trust Sunny, um, she is under suspicion, but um, sort of gets a pass and ends up being hired by the Jens as a nanny. And this is kind of where the story kind of takes off. So it's told from the three, the three perspectives, two of them are expats living in, you know, living a, a life of luxury. And then the third is this um, housekeeper who is actually from Anhui and she is a migrant worker. She's come to Shanghai to sort of support her family and to stake out an identity for herself because the life that she leads at home is um, not to her liking. She's gotten pressure from her family to sort of settle down, get married, have children, and it's not what she wants. So that's sort of a summary of, of what we were promised. Um, I think I can go in a little bit deeper now to how I came to write this book. As I said, I spent a couple years after college um, in China. I have always been interested in writing. And at the time, um, I graduated from NYU and I kind of knew that if I, if I stayed in New York, I would never leave. And I think it was the fear of that that made me move to China. Um, my parents were already living there. So they were living in a service department very similar to the Jens for reasons very similar to the Jens. And so as you know, a 21-year-old coming into this environment, 
um, I was, it was, it was a big culture shock, you know, um, to live in this way where, you know, you wake up and you go to breakfast and there's this, you know, breakfast club and it's all kind of included and people come and clean your rooms. I just felt very out of place. And I think that on top of this feeling of, um, you know, Chinese isn't my, my primary language. So to be a writer, to be somebody who very much forms her own identity around her uh, need to communicate with the written word um, and suddenly finding, finding myself to be inarticulate and to, to be lacking vocabulary, uh, to, to have my, my way of speaking to be sort of downgraded to, you know, the level that a, a child would, would, would speak um, at was hard for me. Um, and it was, a, it was a lot of adjusting, but I think that this feeling of being alienated really helped me in writing the story and it, and, and it, it helped me take notes. It helped me write down all the things that were interesting and strange to me about this new world that I was living in and about the people that I was meeting and the interactions that I was watching happen between, um, you know, my parents' friends and my parents and um, the people who worked in the, in the hotel, people out in nightlife. All of that became fodder for what, what would become this novel, though I didn't know it at the time. Um, so during my time in Shanghai, I was just kind of absorbing. And I was writing, I was working a novel that was not this novel. Um, and I had that sort of stewing in my brain for a really long time. And, um, and then eventually I moved away from China. I went back to New York. I got a job as a product manager at a software company. I led a really different life. I was still writing at night. I was writing on weekends. I was dreaming about, you know, being a writer full time. And I didn't, I wrote about China, but I didn't write this novel. Um, I was way too close to it. And then I went to uh, my graduate program and I wrote a short story called Ayi. And Ayi is based on, uh, Ayi was inspired, what is where the, the, the characters of Sunny was born initially. So Sunny is an Ayi, and Ayi is basically like a nanny, but somebody who does more than that. Um, there's a character in the book that calls her the, super, the superhero of nannies. And um, so she's sort of like the hired help. And uh, the first three chapters of this book told from Sunny's perspective, uh, those were actually the short story. And I had a writing professor look at it and say, you know, this really seems like it wants to be a novel. And so that gave me the, I think the permission, I don't, I didn't know that I needed it, but I think I did need someone to, to give me permission to write about you know, this time in my life, these two years that I spent that were so close to me and yet still felt so far away in a sense because I felt like I wasn't Chinese enough to write this story if, if that, you know, makes any sense to you all. Um, but then, you know, I thought about it and um, it, what a weird time, you know, what a weird time to be in the city where it's growing so rapidly. There are so many international citizens in Shanghai at this time. Um, so many buildings being built. Uh, it was just so, such a strange time to be there, I felt. And um, I felt like because I witnessed it, I had to bear witness, you know, I really wanted to put it down on paper. And so I began this journey of writing this book uh, over the two years that I spent at my graduate program in Wisconsin. And uh, after I wrote the book, I um, found an agent, and we sold it. So a couple years later, here, here we are now. And, and now I've been, you know, speaking about the book to many other groups. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been a really interesting journey. So, okay, let me see. Um, I think this is, this might be a good time for me to break and, and, and just go back into reading a little bit more. I've spoken to you a lot about the character Sunny. Um, and so maybe I'll read a little bit from her section just so you can have a sense of her voice. Um, let's see. Okay. So you know what? I'm just going to start with chapter one because this is from Sunny's point of view. One day you'll walk into a suite and find doors closed to you. 
the second bedroom, the study, the many closets. We had guests over, Kaikai will say. We went ahead and tidied a little ourselves. But that won't explain the jade missing from the display case or her designer shoes gone from the entryway. In the master bedroom, someone will have done your job, badly. A bureau cleared, its contents stuffed out of sight. The bed made so that the, that the sheets still hang loose from the mattress. Tai Tai will stay in the next room with the baby. She will not come out until after you've gone, but for once she'll be listening to you, listening for the sound of your feet. With fewer rooms to clean, you'll finish up quick and wheel the cart back through the service entrance to the laundry hall. That's when you'll take out your phone and text your loved ones the news. You're about to be accused. When Sunny had heard this speech from Rose on her first day of work five years ago, she hadn't thought much of it. She'd assumed it was just an, out, an old housekeeper's attempt to scare her new partner, a way of saying, I know what's what, and you know nothing. Sunny was expert at knowing nothing. Where she'd come from, she'd spent more than a year as a professional odd jobber, a forever apprentice, hired out by her parents for gigs around the hometown. She fixed motors with a handyman and skinned vegetables for restaurant stews. She'd washed laundry and delivered cargo, rubber tires and concrete slabs and dead chickens in need of plucking. On a bicycle, her load sometimes a few hundred pounds more than her own weight. In every job, she had been trained by someone like Rose, a person too, too old to learn new skills and who craved recognition for the ones she already had. This kind of trainer expected Sunny to learn quickly and yet, resented her for doing so. Sunny was tired of being a novice. She was determined to be great at something, and cleaning homes was as good as anything else. Nah, it would be different here. Full-time job, no end date. Rose had led Sunny down the hall to the changing room, listing the shortcomings of the hotel and service departments. The guests and residents were wealthy and therefore very particular. Management was unfriendly at best. They hired English speakers for the front desk, and those employees looked down on the rest of the staff. Worst of all, though, were the accusations of theft. They were easy to make and difficult to defend against. Any one of the maids could be replaced faster than you could fry up an egg for a while at breakfast. There wasn't any shortage of migrant labor. Where's your hometown, Rose asked, opening a locker and retrieving her uniform from its shelf. Hufe, Sunny replied. The outskirts, she didn't say. Rose looked Sunny up and down, her expression making it clear that she understood exactly where she was from. The distinction wasn't necessary. Another one from Anhui province. You will find, very, you will find many friends in this city. As she spoke, Rose pulled on a khaki-colored tunic, black cotton trousers, and standard-issue cloth shoes. She was in her 40s but looked older. Her hair was shot through with silver, and the skin on her face was popped as an orange rind. With practiced twists of her wrists, she rolled up the sleeves of her tunic and adjusted her collar so that it sat comfortably on her shoulders. Sunny had put on her own uniform before leaving the house that morning, but she had ridden from Hong Kong to Lu Jiazui on her motorbike, and by the time she had arrived at the hotel, the entire back of her tunic was drenched in sweat. In the air-conditioned changing room of Lanson Suites, she felt the polyester's damp weight. Sweat had stiffened her bangs in flat strokes across her forehead. Where are your stockings? Rose asked when she caught Sunny pressing a swollen heel against the metal lockers. Xiao Kunyang, she called her, even though Sunny was nearing 29, had not been a girl for some time. You're lucky to have been partnered with me. Some country girls learn quick. Others are back on the job market within a week. We'll see which kind you are. From inside her cubby, Rose pulled out a pair of nude colored hose and handed them over. Each of the housekeeping supplies had its own place on the cart. The bottom shelf held cleaning fluids, towels, and toilet paper, which, resident, which Western residents used with incredible speed. The top shelf was filled with box soaps, tissues, pouches full of needles, and coils of colored thread, plastic combs with teeth too fine for thick Chinese hair like their own. With these, they stocked only the short-term hotel rooms. The permanent residents preferred toiletries imported from abroad. When the cart was ready and both women fully dressed, Rose reached into a cabinet and pulled out a plastic bin full of name tags. Here, she said, pick one. Sunny couldn't read English, but did not want to ask Rose for help. This moment felt too important, too private. Years later, she would remember digging through the bin, not knowing what she was looking for, but knowing it was right the moment she found it. 
S-U-N-N-Y. There was something balanced and generous about the shape of that S, and she liked the way the double N's looked like the U turned upside down. The letters reminded her of, of a row of children playing leapfrog. She especially liked that the tag was still in its plastic wrapping. It meant that no other maid had used it before, that she would be the first S-U-N-N-Y to sweep Lanson Sweet's floors. That was something she had been looking forward to when she arrived in Shanghai, an identity all her own. So that actually reminds me of a story that um, I like to tell people about how I got the idea for that little passage. Um, so, you know, all the people that work in the hotel that I lived in with my family, they all had English names, but of course, you know, they were never called by those names in their real, in their real lives, in their lives with their families or their friends. And um, my mom and I became friends with this one woman um, who was called Nancy and she was something, I think she um, sometimes worked at the front desk. She was sometimes just um, there as a kind of hostess. And um, we saw her one morning and she was wearing this name tag that said Mary and her name was clearly Nancy. So we asked her about it and she said, oh yeah, I couldn't find my name tag this morning. So I, I you know, I just kind of picked one out of the bin. I just borrowed Mary's. And this was mind blowing to me because, you know, I think of a name tag as, I think of her name as so important to my, relationship with her, right? But of course, you know, that's so artificial. It's totally artificial. Um, and it just reminded me of the, the artificiality of your communication with somebody whose job is to make your life easier, you know, just to, you know, be, uh, make you feel like you're being taken care of, someone whose job it is to sort of serve you. Um, so it was a jarring moment. And you know, it just, it, it also just hit me. This is just a uniform, you know, their English names are just a uniform that they kind of put on. Um, so anyway, a sobering moment and, a, and, and just one of those moments where I, I really felt the alienation and the culture difference of, you know, landing in Shanghai as a person who was born in America, but had always been interested in, you know, learning more about my roots and, in spending as much time in China as I could. Um, I realized too that I, that I never told you that the character of Sunny is also inspired by a person that I met while I was in China. She was uh, a waitress in the clubhouse restaurant um, in the hotel where we lived. And um, she, you know, my mother was good friends with her. Friends meaning, you know, they, they, they talked a lot. Obviously my mom was a person who lived in the hotel and she was working. And, um, but I, I do think that we did become friends with her over the time that we knew her. And um, she really wanted me to meet her at first because we were the same age. We were both born in 88, Year of the Dragon. Um, and that is sort of where the similarities ended because she had already, you know, she had a child and she was working like six days a week. She was sending money back home to family. She had been this working woman for many, many, many years and was extremely capable, extremely quick. And I, you know, I, it was really humbling to meet her because I just thought the only thing sort of separating us is the circumstances in which we were born. Um, here I was, you know, I graduated with a BA from NYU, which is one of the most expensive colleges that you can get a college degree from and I was you know living the retired life basically with my parents in Shanghai in this luxury hotel having no career to speak of so really humbling experience and um, that was another moment where I was like wow this I, I you know I can't I'm never gonna forget this person and this person is so inspiring to me and I really wanted to capture her in in the character of Sunny um, and I hope that I did I hope that I did um, in any way, it was sort of a way for me to pay tribute to the time that I got to spend with her. Um, so I've rambled on for quite a while. Lana, do you want, should we start um, seeing if people have any questions or if um, you want sure. me to talk about something? Uh, I can unmute people and see if they have any questions. Um, I have a question. <clears throat> Hi, I have a question. Hi. 
Hi, Lucy. Um, I have not read your book, but it sounds fantastic. I love the description of Rose, and I just cannot wait to read it. So thank, thank you very much. Um, a lot of the relationships you're talking about are very transactional. Yes. And I wondered how you were able to kind of get under the surface to understand what, if anything, was going on with people that was not transactional, how you were able to pierce that. Right. Um, are you asking in terms of like my research in real life or the imaginative work that I did? I, I kind of think both, but, but also, yes, the research in real life is helping you go deeper. Right, right. Yep, we'll flesh out the character. Sure. So um, to answer the first part of the question, in terms of in real life, um, I just listen to a lot of gossip. So a great thing about, you know, being limited in terms of how much you can speak is people treat you like you're dumb, right? So they say a lot of things in front of you. <laughs> um, my hearing is better than my speaking. So um, I listened to a lot of conversations between my mother and her friends, my father and his friends. Um, I met a lot of people who were, you know, Chinese locals. And so they, they, they kind of gave me the lay of the land. This is what this kind of subgroup of people think about this other subgroup of people. Um, the ways that people behave toward one another um, is pretty illuminating, even if you don't understand language, you know, just physical cues and I think that that is what sparks my imagination too of I think something that's really inspiring me to me is to imagine the things that people are thinking and not saying to one another that to me is where kind of where all the all the imaginative goal goal lies um so I think that might be one way of of answering your question um I, I do think that I led with my writer instincts, which is just to sort of be comfortable as a fly, fly on the wall and um, have a lot of the work that's being done be an imaginative rather than necessarily um, forcing someone to tell you, you know, something specific. And I do think when you get close enough with someone there, people like to tell you about themselves. You know, they don't like to be judged, but if you are not, you know, if you're open and you are curious, um, people really like to talk. And I, I, I found that that's been true. And they're curious about you, too. Um, I think, you know, I had been going to China once a year since 20, 2005. And so that was cool because I got to see how quickly it's grown. Every time I went back, it was like, oh, that building used to be there. And one thing that I noticed is over, you know, even like five years, I went from being a person who other people would look at on the street because I didn't look like I was from around there. And they would say, where are you from? Um, and, where, and, you know, what are you wearing? And where did you get that? They were very, very curious. But then by the time that I lived there in 2010, so let's say that was 2005 versus 2010. There were so many international citizens there and Shanghai had become such an international metrop metropolis that people didn't bat an eye. People didn't, you know, it became like a city like New York where you don't even really make eye contact. It became one of those cities. So um, yeah, I, I mean, watching that transformation was absolutely fascinating to me. I don't remember even how I got on this topic. <laughs> but I hope that that answers your question. It's all helpful. Thank you. Um, anyone else? I can go ahead with my questions because I started reading your book. I love it so far. And um, I can't wait to finish it. It sounds um, like you put so much thought and humor and uh, characters so relatable and the descriptions are so amazing. Really, I'm really enjoying your book. Uh, but I'm interested from the perspective of your family, but um, I'm sure they read the book, but what's their reaction? Uh, um, were they involved in the uh, development of any characters? 
Yeah, yeah. So my my family actually they were they were hugely involved um, in many different ways. So you know, from a research perspective, I they were a huge source of of information. Um, there's this so this book jumps around in time a lot. And um, it takes place mostly in 2010, but also in the 1980s, where they were living in China at that time. Um, and those sections that were set in 1980s, I really had to mine them for information. You know, how did a house look? How, what would you do during your days? You know, how would you cook? What would you use to, what kind of stove did you have? Was it even called a stove? All of those little details. Um, I, I used my mom for that a lot. And she actually, um, has been reading the book and translating it for my grandparents to read because my grandparents, I've been listening to their stories my entire life. And I got to a point when I was living in China where I would just go to visit them with my iPhone set to record. And I have hours of footage of just like, you know, grandma, grandpa, what were your lives like? And so little snippets of little anecdotes that I have kind of collected over the years, made it into the novel. Um, also, a really exaggerated and fictionalized, actually it wasn't that exaggerated, but a fictionalized account of my uncle, who, um, you know, hasn't always been on the right side of the law. Um, the stories about him were pretty true, and I, and I really wanted to capture him in the book. I think that in the end, it became someone totally different as you know, it happens when you're writing fiction because your characters sort of have to bend to the world that you created with that for them. They have to tell their own story. But um, my uncle's really mischievous guy. And um, a lot of the ways in which Chang, the young, Wei's younger brother is mischievous and kind of um, makes the story more exciting. My uncle in real life also is. So there were also conversations with him that I recorded and I, I asked him about his past. And so a lot of my research for this book was firsthand, um, which is, sorry, not firsthand. Uh, I don't know if you call that firsthand, but I, I asked sources who had lived through it. And um, I guess that's secondhand and firsthand was me living in 2010 at, during, during the time of the expo. Um, so yeah, I think my, my family, I hope they feel as though they've been represented, even though they're not really the characters in the book, I hope that the, the way that China has portrayed rings true to them um, and that their, you know, the way that their backgrounds have been portrayed rings true to them. And I think that they're really proud. You know, I, I think that there are very few parents that really wholeheartedly support their children's pursuit of the arts in the way that maybe mine have um, supported me. So I'm really grateful for that. And it was a treat to be able to dedicate the book to them and to you know say like, hey, you guys had a hands-on role in making this story happen. My dad was also my first reader. So um, I was writing the end of the book on a, during winter break from grad school where I was with them in Shanghai. And I remember working the last couple chapters while he had been reading the first ones. And my dad is, you know, pretty, he doesn't say very much, uh, <laughs> but you know, he would just kind of come out of the room and having read chapter three and he'd be like, where's chapter four? And then he would go in and read it and come out and be like, where's chapter five? And that's all he ever said. You didn't mean to say like, oh, good job. I liked it. I'm interested in this or that. He'd be like, when's the next chapter done? But I think that was all that I really needed at that point is to have one reader, to have one person being like, I want to know what happens. Um, that was so valuable to me. So um, really, they, they have played all different sorts of roles um, in the publication, in the, in the formation of this book, I should say. Um, since you lived in U.S. and China, where do you find yourself more productive in terms of writing? Um, that has shifted over the years. I think that for this book, it was definitely easier for me to write it in America because that distance, I felt like I was writing a love letter to Shanghai. Um, I missed it, you know, and, and, and writing to me is, is a way of traveling to a different place and spending time there. 
And so I think that being away from it helped. Um, one thing that's true about China now, which didn't, wasn't as true when I was drafting this novel, is that it's almost impossible to sort of get on American internet here. Um, everything is heavy, heavily re uh, regulated. So unless you're searching on Chinese search engines and you're reading these articles in Chinese, which I can't really do, you kind of cut off from the internet, you're cut off from social media. Um, Instagram doesn't work, Facebook, nothing works. WeChat is the only thing that works. Um, so that has at times felt freeing and it, at times felt very frustrating because I think that, you know, when you don't have the internet, all you have is a blank page. It can be nice for a couple days. Eventually you're gonna have to research something online. So um, yeah, I think that being there and not having my social network is good for helping me focus. But after a certain amount of time, it's just kind of unsustainable. And so I am much more productive as a creative person here in the US. I noticed that you used um, some Chinese words in, in your novel. Can you talk a little bit about this? Like um, what, how do you make a decision what you, at what time to use what word? Yeah, that's, that's, an, that's something that I really struggled with. Um, it's so hard when you know, you're writing a story that has both languages in it and you're writing about a family that speaks both languages. And I really wanted to create this, this feeling of having both of those languages in there, but it was really hard to do it. And so I didn't really have any fast and hard rules. Um, if there was a, cause I also didn't want to, you know, explain things within the text. So I, I use Chinese when I couldn't figure out a direct translation to English or when it was like a uniquely Chinese term or a term of the, t of the time. Like the, the term tai tai means something to Chinese people that does not have an equivalent here. Um, so I, I wanted to include that at the risk of dropping, you know, a lot of readers um, for that moment. But I think, I think it was worth it. I think that, you know, the, the, the people who do understand Chinese or do understand China at that time felt seen and, 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 spoke, and spoken to. So that's how I figured it out by not knowing what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, who do you identify with the most in the, in the book, uh, Lena or Sunny or like, yeah, that's, um, I have gone back and forth on this. I, I think Sunny is the one that's closest to my heart because I, 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 I think she is a person who really wants to be independent. And I really identify with that, this desire to be independent, independent and the way in which money has something to do with that, but seems so beside the point to a character like Sunny, I, I, I relate to that too. I think that money has shaped the lives of every character in this book, but um, the idea of money, the way that it seems to Sunny feels a little bit re more relatable to me. Um, I just have a tender spot for her. You know, I think she's, she's the kind of, she's the up and coming character. She's, she's sort of the, um, the underdog in the situation. And I always love, I always love an underdog. So I think she would be my favorite. Um, can you tell us uh, a little bit in terms of um, how, the original idea of writing a book about China, about well, uh, your experiences came to be in terms of um, what was the original focus, whether you wanted to write about class and power or make it, maybe you started as a love, <clears throat> as a love story and then you wanted to put so much more political, cultural, et cetera, et cetera. The development, can you walk us through yeah. Um, well, I mentioned to you that it started out being Sunny's story, right? It started out being the story of a housekeeper living in, a, uh, working in an environment that's very different from the one that she lives in, right? Because Sunny's home is nothing like uh, Lanson Suites. That 
contrast was really interesting to me. And I think that investigating that contrast, that's so tied to class and power. So I don't think I set out being like, I want to write a book about class and power, but there was no way to not write a book about class and power. Um, and I think that that's what led to my decision to write it from the different perspectives because I wanted to show that contrast um, and to kind of show what unified them as well because they're all human beings, you know? And the, the crazy thing to me is that just a couple generations back, Sonny's ancestors and, uh, you know, Lena and Wei's ancestors are probably working the same fields together. So I really wanted to show this, the way that China has transformed over the past couple decades. And um, I think that all of my thoughts about China just kind of magnetize themselves onto this, you know, little short story that then became a novel. Um, so I think that in that way, it, it wasn't so intentional, but I, but it was the, it was the most interesting story that, so, so I was really thinking about all of those questions as I was writing, writing it. Um, I read somewhere that your uh, original title for the book was completely different. <laughs> <laughs> it was called the insolvents it was it was called you want to talk a little bit about that yeah so uh that was it was so this book was my thesis for my for my grad degree it's called the insolvents um most people don't know what that means it, it's it's a financial term it basically means people who are in debt and i wanted to write about that because it, it the characters all feel in debt in some way whether it's culturally you know, um, family ties, everyone felt feels a little bit of shame in one way or another. And then I also wanted to write about the fact that, you know, America had owed a lot of China, um, money to China. And it's kind of like, what do we owe? What do we owe different countries? What do we owe in terms of loyalties to these countries, to our family members, to ourselves as growing individuals, um, to our own right to independence and in creating a life for ourselves that we're happy with. Um, Anyway, so, so this was why I chose the title, The Insolvents, and I sent it to my agent, and she just kept calling it the working title <laughs> because she hated it. And, you know, she had a good point because most people don't know what that means. And it's a book that I think is really emotional. And um, to, so to have a term like The Insolvents, which is a very financial, clinical, dry term, doesn't quite fit. So that's... That's how that happened. So then what we were promised was chosen. Um, and I think that it still is tied to the idea of what we're owed, but is a little bit more human centric. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your mom being a reference librarian in Livingston Library because that hits home? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so my mom worked as a reference librarian for about 10 years. And um, she worked, my, both my parents worked full time. I'm an only child. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time alone and I spent a lot of time at the library. And I remember going there every day after school for a very long time, just doing my homework in one of those, you know, um, wooden kind of booths <laughs> in the reference room. And it just being, you know, so quiet. And then getting up in the middle of my work and going downstairs to an employee lounge and getting a little snack to eat. Um, I, and I also, in, I, I volunteered as um, a shelver and as someone who read books to kids in the children's room. That was really fun. I think that the library to me was a way of, you know, as someone who was kind of trapped in one place for a lot of my life, being an only child with two parents who worked. It was a way for me to leave. It was a way for me to have control over where I went, what I did, you know? And, and so books have always been a source of power for me in that way. Um, and, then, and then actually one of my stops on my book tour was at Livingston Library. And it was so cool to come back and see all the librarians that, that I used to see all the time and to, um, you know, reconnect with a community that had kind of fostered my love of reading. I also read it somewhere that uh, you visited China for the first time when you were 17 and it was a different experience in terms that you 
you saw the countryside? Mm. Oh, right. So that wasn't my first, that wasn't my first time in China, okay. but it was a very interesting experience. That was very different too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I was actually, the first time I went to China, I was like seven and everything scared me and I was ill, you know? I mean, there's a saying called, oh God, how, how does it go? Which is like, literally it means the water and the earth do, do not create happy, <laughs> happiness for your body or something like that and so you know a lot of people when they travel to somewhere like China for the first time it's a lot of like digestive issues for me I had a fever and um, it was definitely uh, really really different from the China that is that this story is set in yeah I, I could agree to that my son-in-law his parents is from Shanghai they were studying they came to this uh, country in the six in the was it my, uh, in the seventies, and they got their master degree, so they stayed and they were. So when my son-in-law graduated from his uh, Columbia or his master degree, uh, major in urban planning, so they want him to move back to Shanghai because they felt that that they want their children go back to their roots. Mm. So same thing happened with my son-in-law. Every time he go, he had upset stomach and then in a hospital. Oh, so I, yeah. He it's just totally to like what you said. He didn't yeah. just keep on. He was backing his parents. I can't. I you know I know how much you want me to go back and and learn my you know my ancestor and then where you come from. And uh, and she he ended up marrying my daughter that doesn't know any the language and they don't my and. Uh, and his mother wasn't really happy with my daughter because they want uh, their son to marry someone, the Shanghainese. Um, my, my, I'm from Hong Kong, I'm Cantonese, okay. and my daughter was born here. So they have the culture, the, everything. They were, you know, the, the mother wasn't too happy with, wasn't, you know, uh, my daughter at the beginning when they were dating. Uh, they were day for nine years. They lived together about five years ago before they um, decided to get married. But then uh, all those of nine years, not one gift from his mother-in-law. Oh. From, from her mother-in-law. Because <laughs> she still, you know, his mother still expected that his son would go back and, and, and have a family in Shanghai because he, they want the, the son and, oh, you know, the, the, the culture and things like that. But then, yeah, but then they didn't work out. So my, my son, and, well, they came back. He went, the parents took him, they, he went back like three, four times to stay for her summer. It still didn't work out. The, 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 the system, the culture there, and then they it's came. Really, it's a really hard it's adjustment. A, it's a hard, yeah, it's, it's hard, right? Adjustment. But his yeah. parents retired, he went back, and they went back and bought an apartment in Shanghai, and they go for him back now. They only like come back here tax season. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder if your parents like stay there permanently now. I mean, since now your mom retired, they are they coming yeah. back for tax season to their tax. <laughs> they don't even do that. I mean, they they've been there for they've been there permanently since two thousand six. Oh. So, and my dad owns his own company now there. So I really think that at, okay. there was a while where I was like, they're going to come back. They're going to retire here. But now yeah. I think my dad will never retire. <laughs> so I, I don't really know if they, which is really sad for me to think about because I always imagined, you know, growing, being an, an adult in the same country, at least as my parents. Yeah. Um, but I think that that, that is less and less likely as, as time goes on. Um, but so you don't think you will move back uh, eventually? I don't think so. And this is why. Because when I was in China, I tried, my parents really wanted me to find a job there and work there. They said, you know, there's yes. so much opportunity and there was, mm -hmm. but the idea of, and I had so many jobs. I, first I was at an intern at a law firm, uh, which really helped, you know, with my Chinese. Um, and then I was a, I worked at a TV station. At first I was a copy editor and then I was um, a co-host for a TV show for a little bit. And then I 
anyway, so I did all kinds of things. And I realized that it's just so hard to be a creative in China. You're always worried you're going to say the wrong thing, right? Yeah. And not only that, but I think that this idea of free speech and lack of censorship is so embedded in, like, that's the most American part of me. Yes. So I think once you move somewhere, you realize how American you are. I don't ever feel that American when I'm here, right? Because you only notice the things that, that make you different from everybody else. But then when you move to China, you're like, oh, wait, I'm not like these people either. No. So, so I think that... Yeah, it, being in China made me feel very American. But it, but it's interesting what you say about the the regionalization. The whole you know, parents get really involved when it comes to marriage. Mm -hmm. um, a thing that I, I remember seeing in Shanghai was like in the parks on a Sunday, parents would kind of hand out flyers for, and like on the flyer would be the stats of their child you know, born this age, like height assets. this age, here's a photo, yeah. here are assets. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, Chinese parents can be very involved in the matchmaking process. I remember being mm -hmm. in a cab one time and this cab driver was just, you know, after just a few minutes of dialogue, he wanted to know if I had a boyfriend and if my marriage date was set because he wanted to set me up with his son. And I, you know, I politely declined. <laughs> but I couldn't get out of that car, car fast enough. Um, it's, there's much more of this community mindset and in terms of, and, and it's very family oriented. Yes. Um, so everybody's in your business all the time and mm -hmm. it's kind of nice and it's kind of not nice too. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what are you working on now? What are you writing now? I'm working on my second novel. I just finished a draft and it's with my agent now. So I hope that she sends back, you know, encouraging uh, responses. But um, yeah, it's, it's actually about, um, it's coming of age story. It's set in Wisconsin. It's about these three young women who are on their way to becoming career actresses. So it's a little bit of a theater world, but it still deals with a lot of um, issues of family and identity and uh, culture differences, which is sort of what I come back to with my writing a lot. Well, thank you very much. This has been nice. Yeah. That was my question as well, Lucy. <laughs> um, do you want to quickly show the pictures? Or? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, so I can share the screen. So in, so this, this photo is of um, a trip that I took to, oh, yes, let's start there. Okay, so um, in the book, uh, Chang, the younger brother, comes back because of the Shanghai Expo. So if you've never heard of the Shanghai Expo, it is a world expo. It was held in 2010. It was a huge deal in Shanghai at the time. Um, it was the expo that had the largest number of countries participate. Um, it's basically, they along the Huangpu River in Shanghai, they cleared a, a big stretch of space where each country could erect a pavilion. And so anybody could visit. And if you got a ticket to go, you could just go into these different pavilions. It was basically a way to bring the rest of the world to Shanghai. And it was hugely publicized. Everyone in China was super excited about it. Shanghai people were really, really proud of it. Um, so I thought I would show you a few pictures of the expo, especially because um, there's a, a pivotal scene in the book that takes place in the expo. And this is the China Pavilion. Um, so you can see like there's, there's people very small in the photo, just for scale, how large this exhibition hall was. It now exists as a museum in Shanghai, so you can still go and see it if you like. Um, can move to the next slide or next picture. Um, this one, this weird looking building is the UK pavilion. So this is just another example of a, one of the pavilions that was erected. The theme of the World Expo that year was better city, better life. So a lot about how are we going to treat our natural surroundings better. Um, this is the UK pavilion. These little hair like things that look like needles, they're actually acrylic rods. There are 60,000 of them. And then if you go to the next picture, 
um, this is what they look like up close inside the pavilion. Mm -hmm. There are, it's a seed bank. So these are different species of seeds from all over the world that are encapsulated in these rods. And so it's sort of like a way of trying to not let things go out of becoming extinct, I guess, way to preserve nature. And um, they had a really um, environment, environmentally conscious way of, of constructing this building. The, the entire thing um, is made in a way that sort of circulates air and it's not lit by any kind of um, electricity. It's all sunlight that's being filtered through the ends of the acrylic rods. I think there might be one more picture if you click. Yeah, so that's what it looks like from farther away. This is what it looks like if you're standing in the room looking up. Um, it's amazing. I, I went, my boyfriend at the time was working there as um, one of the people who um, was a guide at the pavilion. And there is a scene that actually takes place inside this pavilion for one night. Um, okay, let's move on to the next photo. I don't even know what we have coming up. Oh, here's a photo of uh, my manuscript. As oh, I see the name yeah. and solvents. <laughs> the name solvents, right. So this is super early on. This was like when I was, I, I think all of those different colored flags on the side are the different chapters, the alternating perspectives. And as you can see, I'm a really heavy editor <laughs> of my own work. Um, so this was the, the state that it was in when it was still a thesis and before it got sold as a book. Um, I can go to the next photo. Okay, so here's a photo of Shanghai. Um, it's got these super tall buildings. Uh, this river that you see over here is the Huangpu River. It separates Pudong from Puxi. Pudong is the um, eastern side of the river. Puxi is the west, the west side of the river. Um, this is from one of the tallest buildings. So it's, it just gives you a really great view. Um, the bottle cap building there is the Shanghai World Financial Center. I th I'm trying to remember where this picture was taken. I think it was taken from the Shanghai Tower. Um, so we have more pictures of the Shanghai Tower if you want to click. Um, yeah, so there's the Orient Oriental Pearl Tower there. That was one of the earliest uh, structures that kind of became emblematic of Shanghai. And then go to the next photo. This is Jin Mao. So these are just, you know, wanted to show you a little bit of what it looks like from during the night. Uh, they have these tall buildings where you can kind of go and have dinner and see the view. And uh, this is one of those photos taken from one of those restaurants. Can click the next one. Okay, so when we lived in Shanghai, all right, so so a couple couple photos back. Remember that really that photo of um, the city taken up from really way up high. Mm -hmm. That building is is this. <laughs> so this is what it looked like before it was built. Um, this photo was taken from the window of one of the apartment buildings that we lived in. So this entire neighborhood of photos that I've shown you right now is all kind of where the book is set, and we got this photo before they really started doing much stuff. And then very, very quickly it was erected to the tallest building in Shanghai. I think it's the second tallest in the world actually. Um, so there's another, that kind of swirly guy that disappears into the smog, that's the Shanghai uh, tower. And um, this is a photo of what Shanghai looks on a, looks like on a pretty normal day. It's really got so much smog, it's really, really bad for you. Um, so, this may be another reason why your son-in-law was not able to last very long in China. <laughs> um, next photo. Okay, so, he, so here we have, um, I went on a visit to a tea farm and uh, there is a character in the book at one point in, in his life, he works at a tea farm. So I thought I would show you a little bit of what that looks like. There's the tea leaves being dried after they've been harvested. And the next photo, I think, is the same thing. Okay. I think that's the last one. Oh, okay. There, you, there we go. I see. That is it. Yep. Yeah, the, the last couple photos may not make 
much sense until you read the book. <laughs> All right. Um, anyone else have any questions or then they might stop. It's been wonderful, wonderful presentation and talk and it I hope it's inspired people to read your book. Our library has several copies of the book because it was originally scheduled to be um, the book discussion uh, for the month of uh, June. So we do have several copies and you're more than welcome to borrow. Um, thank you again, Lucy, all the best to you and I hope we'll get all your books in, a, in, a, in our library in the future. <laughs> thank you so much. This has been really fun. Thanks to everyone who came and listened and asked questions. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Nice meeting you too. Thank you. Night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Lana. Bye-bye, Lucy. All Bye. the best.